shall overcome. We shall overcome. At the heart of 20th century American history is what distinguished historian Jacqueline Dowd Hall called a long civil rights movement. It took root in the liberal and radical milieu of the late 1930s, was intimately tied to the rise and fall of the New Deal order, accelerated during World War II, stretched far beyond the South, was continuously and ferociously contested, and in the 1960s and 1970s inspired a movement of movements that defies any narrative of collapse. The long civil rights movement in North Carolina and the hostility and obstruction that accompanied it are well documented in the libraries of Duke University, NC Central University, NC State, and UNC Chapel Hill. In 2011, the four university libraries comprising the Triangle Research Library Network began a three-year project to scan 400,000 pages of 20th century archival materials, including correspondence, reports, speeches, newspaper clippings, and photographs, and to digitize 500 sound recordings of oral histories, speeches, organizational meetings, and radio spots relevant to the movement. All of this material is or soon will be freely available online. The documents and sound recordings echo voices of those who sought progressive and sometimes radical social change, those who stood against lynching, Jim Crow, segregation, discriminatory hiring and housing, economic injustice, anti-union measures, and a legal system stacked against non-whites and those without means, and those who stood for equal rights and justice. The documents also reveal the actions and logic of those who resisted social change through violence and vitriol and those who opted for resistance using civility and pragmatism, a strategy rooted in the progressive image upon which North Carolinians prided themselves. The movement stretches well beyond the decade that most Americans recognize as the civil rights era, from the 1954 Brown v. Board decision to the passage of the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act in 1964-1965. It also stretches well beyond the heroics and villainy of a few. In her seminal 2005 historical essay, Hall wrote, by confining the civil rights struggle to bodlerized heroes to a single halcyon decade and to limited non-economic objectives, the master narrative simultaneously elevates and diminishes the movement. Early efforts to address social and economic inequality are found in NC State University's records on agricultural extension services, which by the 1920s had begun modest attempts to aid rural African-American families and had even hired African-American home demonstration agents. Interracial cooperation in this era sought racial uplift in public health improvements, but did not challenge segregation. These groups, usually composed of academics, educators, and progressive civic and religious leaders, met in commissions, associations, and women's clubs and auxiliaries. At a women's interracial meeting in 1920, North Carolina educator and founder of the Palmer Memorial Institute, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, challenged the predominantly white female audience to consider racism and race relations from the perspective of African-American women and children. I want to say to you, when you read in the paper where a colored man has insulted a white woman, just multiply that by 1,000, and you have some idea of the number of colored women insulted by white men. Charlotte Hawkins Brown, October 1920. During the Depression, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared that the South presents right now the nation's number one economic problem. In North Carolina, agricultural laborers and mill and tobacco workers faced horrendous living and working conditions, discriminatory practices, and mortal danger if they tried to organize. Blacks and working class whites with similar economic needs were pitted against each other by whites in power in an ongoing effort to quash interracial cooperation on the ground. Frank Porter Graham, president of the University of North Carolina through the 1930s and 40s, embodied the cautious approach of white Southern liberals. Although he stopped well short of instituting dramatic change on the campus by admitting African-American graduate students, he was concerned with discrimination, poverty, human rights, and dignity, and did support progressive organizations and causes. In a 1939 radio address, 
Graham noted the contradictions between the realities of life for most Southerners and the nation's democratic ideals and abundant resources. Democracy had provided equality of suffrage, but not equality of opportunity. The freedom to worship, but not the right to work. The freedom of assembly and the right of collective petition, but not the freedom of the self-organization of workers. Corporate privilege, but not agricultural parity. Political liberty, but not social security against the hazards of modern society. The old political liberties and social drift of a more static society are tragically insufficient to meet the vast economic changes, financial crises, and the deep human needs of our dynamic modern society. Frank Porter Graham, 1939. In a radio address broadcast on Durham station WDNC, James Shepard, founder and president of what is now North Carolina Central University and noted civic leader in Durham's middle-class African-American community, pointed out the sting of discrimination and racism. Let me remind my friends again that we cannot degrade any person of any race and expect the very best of him, that we cannot rob a man or woman of any race of his or her self-respect and expect him or her to reach forth for the better things of life. James E. Shepard, January 1945. Opponents of social change justified segregation and discrimination with dire predictions of social collapse and increased criminality or racial and sexual violence aimed at whites, particularly white women. Other opponents tried what they considered rational arguments and biological reasoning. The chair of the anatomy department at the University of North Carolina Medical School, Wesley Critz George, used biology and genetics to rationalize racism and segregation. He wrote extensively on the dangers of race mingling, miscegenation, and integration often for scholarly publication, but also on behalf of groups such as the White Patriots of North Carolina. In the 1950s and early 1960s, school desegregation, boycotts of discriminatory businesses, and segregated public spaces and transportation took center stage. These black-led challenges to the status quo ignited new conflicts between races and generations, as well as socioeconomic classes, political and civic alliances, and community organizations. The dividing line lay between those who demanded freedom now and those who cautioned, go slow. Through efforts like the 1956 Pearsall Plan, North Carolina lawmakers effectively delayed the desegregation of public schools until federal courts forced compliance more than a decade after Brown v. Board. White citizens' councils, composed of respected community leaders, and the Ku Klux Klan both sought to preserve a social construct premised on white supremacy. Efforts to thwart desegregation ranged from racist and hyperbolic rhetoric to outright terrorism. At the beginning of a decade that would be characterized by sit-ins, freedom rides, peaceful protests, and violent confrontations, Alfonso Elder, the president of North Carolina Central University, succinctly captured the movement's challenge to the segregationist social construct. We are seeking a new order of things. This is an age in which people everywhere are demanding respect as human beings. Alfonso Elder, November 1960. American college students played a pivotal role in the events of the 1960s. In North Carolina, they launched the Greensboro sit-ins, voter registration drives, and campus protests, such as the Allen Building takeover at Duke University, which showed their determination to make a difference. Asa Spaulding, an African-American businessman and civic leader in Durham, spoke to that work. There is no more burning issue facing the American public than that of civil rights. Young people are on the march. They will not be deterred by arrests, jail sentences, fire hoses, police dogs, nor death itself, for they feel that freedom and first-class citizenship are in the air and that they must be permitted to breathe this air. Asa Spaulding, September 1963. Praised by civic leaders like Spaulding, an activist seeking socioeconomic reforms to relieve the devastating impact of poverty, 
student protesters were simultaneously denounced by others, including politicians. U.S. Congressman James Gardner condemned the students' actions and deemed them agitators, extremists, and radicals who were threatening society. Though landmarks, the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 did not mark the finish line for the movement. In 1971, civil rights activist Elna Spaulding recognized, All over our country, the months ahead are predicted to be filled with uncertainty, strife, and violence. Despite such prophecy, how fortunate we are to live in this extraordinary time of change. By forming this broader bond of concern for our fellow man, we not only gather strength, but motivation to use our creative capacities for the good of all mankind. Elna Spaulding, April 1971. The work of civil rights activists persisted through the 1970s and 1980s and continued to meet with resistance, violence, and a re-energized national conservatism that hit its stride during the Reagan era. Poverty and environmental and economic injustice endangered families, neighborhoods, and communities. Civil rights activism expanded to include migrant farmers, workers, prisoners, gays and lesbians, and women. As Charlotte Hawkins Brown had indicated in 1920, African-American women still confronted sexual violence at the hands of white men. In 1974, Joan Little, a young African-American prisoner, was charged with first-degree murder for stabbing a corrections officer who was found half-naked in her cell. Little asserted self-defense, accusing the jailer of sexual assault and abuse. Her 1974 to 1975 trial captured national attention and Little became a symbol for feminists, civil rights activists, and opponents to the death penalty. A defense fund was raised and the trial ended in acquittal. Labor organizers, including those in the Communist Workers' Party, campaigned for workers' rights and faced strong anti-union sentiments in North Carolina, a right-to-work state. They also risked their lives. In Greensboro at the end of 1979, Neo-Nazis and Klansmen attacked CWP labor organizers. Members of the Greensboro Police Department were also implicated in the attack. Five party members were murdered in broad daylight in front of many witnesses, yet no one was ever criminally convicted. In the 1980s came pronouncements from United States Senator Jesse Helms that AIDS was God's punishment for homosexuality, followed by the HIV discriminatory laws he wrote or championed. The Joan Little trial, the Greensboro massacre, and persecution of HIV-positive men, women, and children laid bare the unrelenting racial animosity, discrimination, and social tension still present in the South and in North Carolina, the region's self-described most progressive state. More than four decades after the 1947 journey of reconciliation that collapsed in Chapel Hill but inspired the 1961 Freedom Rides, Historian Helen Edmonds spoke to the graduating class of North Carolina Central University. My young friends, it is a changed world in which you will make your way. And this world bequeathed to you is yours to keep and improve. There must be no turning back to where things are old and habits familiar. You must step boldly into the new day and master new patterns of thinking and acting. Helen Edmonds, May 1991. The long civil rights movement remade the South and the nation, yet it would be a mistake to assume that the progress made in securing voting rights, protecting workers, fighting poverty, and guaranteeing equality for all can be taken for granted. This history offers important lessons. Times have changed, but the struggle continues today. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Well, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. We're going to pray for freedom. We're going to let it shine. We're going to pray for freedom. We're going to let it shine. 
We're going to pray for freedom. We're going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine.